Welcome to Going for a Twix, the number one thick of it podcast. My name is Tom Dunson, and joining me, as always, is my good friend and co-host, the Dan to my Ollie, Mr. Adam Taylor. Hello, everyone. Hello. So, last episode of the first series. Uh, I, I think it's probably the best one in the series. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they definitely got better as they went along. It does feel like a sort of season finale kind of thing to it. So, we start the episode very nice, very friendly. Uh, everyone's coming in, have a nice giggle. Hugh's just been, I think he calls it, the, he's been the fucking daddy. Uh, uh, what was it? It was like committee, committee stage for his bill, wasn't it? Yeah, so yeah, so he must have a bill working its way through Parliament, hmm. certain oh, yeah. stage of debate. I believe it's the uh, the housing bill, isn't it? Yes, yeah. And everyone's having a lovely time. And then in comes the, our, our newest character. Everyone's very excited when we have a new character in this thick of it. And that is Mr. Dan Miller. Ah, yes, yeah. Dan Miller. He's probably the biggest side character that we've had so far. Yeah, because he features quite prominently in the episode as a uh, almost like a foil to Hugh, doesn't he? He's definitely he strikes me as almost the alpha of this <laughs> ministerial jungle, the most level bloke on the planet. And Hugh, as not a very likable guy, as just your standard forties uh, middle class minister, is a bit intimidated by him. Oh yeah, Hugh, what is he? He's, he's, he's boring. He's just like everyone else. Not particularly <laughs> likeable. And then, of course, you get Dan Miller in, who thrives on the kind of attention you get as a politician. Oozes charisma everywhere he goes. Yeah, too much. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's got that slippery, like, slimy. Ugh. Do you think... I always think about this. Do you think Dan Miller is based on anyone from the, gov- the Tony Blair government? Well, apparently, he's meant to be based on David Miliband. David Miliband? Oh, yeah, That's... but I don't. I think our generation hasn't had that much contact with David Miliband mm. because, you know, he lost to Ed on a technicality and then pissed off to America. So, what well, how different things could have been if the Dan Miller of the real world had managed to get further into politics? Well, I mean, apparently we would have won the 2015 general election. Not that we're political, obviously. Um, no, it's a very apolitical podcast. Exactly. But uh, oh, these are the same people that said that Jeremy Corbyn wouldn't do too well and we wouldn't leave the European Union. So, you know. Very, much... very apolitical. I like it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think this is a brilliant moment where he comes in and he was trying to get a way to talk to everyone, and then was just going up to Dan. It's, it's just you know, it's a very, it's a brilliant introduction to Dan's character. I think they could have uh, done that, it much better. It really is. You know, there's a bit where Hugh Abbott sort of like puts a hand out for a handshake, and Dan Miller like so clearly, mm-hmm. deliberately puts to like turns his back to Hugh, as if to just sort of soak in the attention of everyone else before mm-hmm. finally. Having asserted his dominance, hmm. turn to Hugh. I th- yeah, I think this is the um, one of the few occasions where we see uh, the thick of it doing uh, show not tell very well because they're very good at doing tell not show with characters like Tom and the PM, but this is very much you get the measure down within seconds without ever really having to be told it. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, you can read the clues in the room. Hmm. It's so obvious. Everyone's talking to Dan, saying his name over and over again. Hugh is left out in the cold. Hmm. Uh, there's a little bit I want to highlight next, which is uh, we cut to a scene of Malcolm in his office on the phone to, I believe it's Tom, uh, talking about the uh, the focus group fuck up. And I've written down the quote. Like it? Yeah, he, he said, I can only cook with what I've been given, which I is the first, I think, to my knowledge, it's the, definitely the first time. I think it's the only time you've ever seen Malcolm make an excuse for himself in the whole series. It's the only time where he says, look, you know, it's not my fault. I'm really good. It's everyone else's fault. They're shit. That's his job to make everyone who's shit be good. Yeah. Oh, no, Joe, I hadn't realized that, but um, no, that sounds right. Do you want to say it with a bit more confidence? Or <laughs> yeah, no, th- yeah, that's that's absolutely right. I don't. I can't think of another time where Malcolm sort of tries to point the finger at anyone else. I think this is very much indicative of this. What we've been saying throughout this series is that Mar- Malcolm is a very different character in the first series. He doesn't turn into the swaggering one-liner put-down machine that he is. Secretary. He's much more vulnerable and human in this series, which I which I kind of like, but at the same time, I don't want, say, in Star Wars, you wouldn't want Darth Vader showing off his vulnerable side. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't yeah. want to see him as a as an eight-year-old, for example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, because there is, there's, I mean, they sort of, they really lean into it in the future series, don't they, where Malcolm is some sort of all-knowing, all-seeing, monolithic villain. In, in this in this series, he strikes me as more of a more vulnerable character. Mm-hmm. I did write down as well with the... Um, he's asking for Glenn and Terry to be brought in so he can shout at them. 
it's obviously that he's really angry, but he's got nowhere to direct it to. So he just needs to find and like this is his equivalent of punching a pillow. He just needs some junior people in so he can bollock them. Absolutely. In fact, is this is this the first time we meet his assistant, Sam? I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, and he's talking about needing a shout, but he's he's so cordial, so polite to his uh, to his assistant. I'm glad you brought it up because you probably uh, touch on Sam now. I love Sam. She's such a good character, even though she's maybe two lines at the most. I don't know if she says any. Yeah, I can't think of anything in this episode. She's, she mm. is just sort of the one that gets the... She brings the people for the bollocking. Yeah, she's... Uh, uh, we should point out she's uh, Malcolm's PA or secretary, something like that. Mm. I don't think they really state it. And she's the one person that Malcolm seems to like. Yeah, yeah even when he's working himself up into a bit of a rage, or he knows he's, he needs to let it out, hmm. he's still, you know, please and thank you to, yeah. to Sam. And there's no reason that he couldn't yell at Sam if he wanted to. If he really needed someone to yell out right now. She's only a stone's throw away from his office. Yeah. And yeah, you get me, what does he say? Like, get, get me John at culture. I have a bit of a shout now. I think of what I want, if there's ever, a, if Armando Imanucci is listening to this podcast, uh, if for whatever reason he clicks on it by accident, uh, Give us the spin-off where we see Sam and Malcolm. <laughs> Do what? We just fly on the wall. Whatever. Now. I'll watch whatever. I want to see the, the moment they meet and then like some kind of I don't know, maybe some kind of buddy cop drama. What where, <laughs> where they have to sort of get each other's begrudging respect. Yeah, where they go by the book and one is a maverick. Yeah. And they go These to mutually accept people. Downing Street. Yeah. So then uh, Hugh and Glenn and Terry end up in 10 Downing Street. Glenn and Terry for their barking and Hugh for, I believe, his dinner with the Prime Minister. Yeah. Mm. As, as he not so subtly pointed out to Dan Miller. Yeah. Well, the, well, in the corner of the room. Yeah. And we have the first mention of the flat. Now, the flat is will be the main focus point of this episode. Ah, yes. And Chekhov's believe, flat. Yes. And I believe the uh, point of the flat is he owns a flat in London when he has his house in driving distance, therefore we shouldn't have second hope in London. Which I think is fair enough, to be honest. You shouldn't you shouldn't really be having two houses with you know, unless you want people to think you're a wanker. Well yeah, in fact one of the reasons that he says he needs a house is because everyone else has got one. It's 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 not necessary. That is so like primary school level logic. <laughs> I know. Just elevate it to what I mm. assume is a multi million pound flat mm. in London. If if Hugh Abbott's uh, if Hugh Abbott said that to his mum, she'd say, "Well, if everyone else jumped off a cliff, would you?" Exactly. Well, I don't know. How close is the cliff to uh, the centre of London? In this scene, we have Glenn and Hugh discussing their evil, nefarious plan, which is to sell it without selling it, pretend put it on the market, but don't accept any offers. Which, in my opinion, is a shite plan, because of course, eventually you're going to get caught out. Someone's going to say, well, why aren't you selling it? What, what's going on? Like, what's he expecting to happen? If it's on the market for two years? Exactly. That is at best a short-term solution. Yeah. Let's face it. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, the newspapers wouldn't let this go. You can just imagine some of those journalists coming in and going, you know, uh, that Hugh Abbott's flat. That still hasn't sold. Hmm. Yeah, I can't imagine a journalist saying, let's cut him some slack. <laughs> yeah. That's right up there with a journalist saying, I respect Andrew Neil." <laughs> uh, yeah, or uh, someone calling Andrew Neil uh, a leftist liberal or whatever. Yeah. Who could be so stupid as to Who do knows? that? Who knows? So then uh, we move on to a very interesting scene, I feel, which yeah. is Dan Miller and Ollie's aftermath of their squash game. I uh, think, yes. Yeah. I think we talked about uh, Ollie's ambitious side in the first episode of this podcast, and this just really cements it. I know, it's, it's almost cringy, really, isn't mm. it? In fact, they sort of talk about how awkward the situation is, don't they? I think mm. you just catch it sort of offhand, where Ollie goes, yeah, but you need me to suck up to you. I mean, you're a politician. So, but he's more than happy to do it. And I thus, do like... the symbiotic relationship continues mm. between I... sycophant and politician. Yeah. So we have Ollie and Dan getting on, getting on like a house on fire, getting on like two great mates. And while that's happening, we have uh, Glenn and Hugh prepping for the Angela Heaney interview. Yeah, presumably, yeah, presumably about the uh, the housing bill, or at least that's what they think. Ooh, that's, Ooh. That's a bit of foreshadowing there. <laughs> but, Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's subtle. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I don't think it's been subtle many times. <laughs> and I did say this first episode we'd have a uh, little tally for good Glendines. I will I will stick one up there right now. Here we go for uh, 
where's the Nazi gold, you donkey shagger? I know that that's an int- when Hugh Abbott asks him to ask anything, that is an interesting question. Yeah, <laughs> for a first one that pops out of Glenn's mouth. <laughs> I feel like I've got some backstory to it. I know that doesn't just come out of nowhere, does it? Yeah. That is uh, Glenn Cullen. Maybe he's got a bit of a colourful past. No, we wouldn't like to speculate. Hmm. Exactly. Everything we say on this podcast is hard facts. And so we move on to the interview there with Angela Heaney. It turns out uh, Angela Heaney isn't g- working for the Express anymore. She's moved to the Daily Mail, which, as we all know, is a twat mag. <laughs> I felt like that. Yeah. Apolitical, obviously. We're, we're not taking any. It's written by twats for twats. And yeah. so she's really laying into you. And I think this is the area we should touch on quite quickly. Glenn knows that uh, Angela's at the mail the night before the interview. Malcolm doesn't find out until the interview started. That is an example of him slipping, isn't it? Yeah. Senior communications manager, by the way. And he doesn't even know which newspaper people work for. Surely he should have a text alert on his phone every time someone moves paper. They present that as quite a big bit of his character, knowing Mm. everyone who's working in, in journalism. Yeah. In quite a few episodes, he points out, you know, oh, I know all the editors. I know these producers. In fact, I think it's the next episode. He goes over to uh, is it ITN, yeah, and uh, and has a chat with their producer. So I mean, that's a massive part of his character. So for him to slip up like this, and I assume it takes a while to change papers. It's not like you do it overnight. I presume there's been a process. Well, I, I assume they can't. They're not doing some sort of pinch the journalist before Malcolm can find out and then send them to interview a, a government minister. Yeah, it's it's, it's a really weird. Uh, this is another bit of Malcolm slipping up and. I, I don't like this part of his character. I think I prefer him to be well-polished but vulnerable rather than shit. <laughs> yeah, rather than just incompetent. Yeah, it's not my favourite part of his character in this series. But it yeah. does give us the brilliant scene of him hauling out of his office down to Dosa. I mean, that has become iconic, yeah. hasn't it? Him running down Whitehall. <laughs> what I really like is in some shots, you can see, uh, for whatever reason, Peter Capaldi isn't really going very fast. And they're trying to make it look like he's fucking sprinting it down. Yeah, but obviously the camera fucking... man. Yeah, he's got to add as much dramatic uh, license to it as he can. <laughs> Peter Capaldi, he's just walking through this earthquake. I don't know what. I... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that is iconic. Him running yeah. through the building as well. Yeah. Go, where, where is he? Yeah, highlight of the episode. It is, it is up there. Gotta be honest. Mm. So after Angela has roasted Hugh with an adventurous life, he comes out and just goes, "What the fuck's going on?" Because his world's imploded around him. Everything was fine, everything was dandy, the birds were singing, the flowers were blooming, and then that's happened, and just like everything is folded in on him. I know everyone's sort of into crisis mode, and Hugh is literally just standing there going, What have I done? What's going on? Everyone is like six steps ahead of uh, Hugh at that point, and he's still trying to catch up. He has no idea what's fucking going on. Yeah, but to be fair, I mean, that seems like a central point of Hugh's character as well, doesn't it? He does just sort of stand around and. And so what has happened is, I believe it's the Express has got the story about Hugh not selling his fat. And I don't know, has Angela got that from working the Express before moving to the mail? Or is the mail that run it? It doesn't, that that bit's not very clear. I was sort of under the impression they'd got it independently because they said that the Express had been putting offers in on the house, Mm. 40 grand above the asking price, and they were still rejected. But I don't know, there there could have been some sort of talking Mm. between them and, and Angela Heaney. Yeah, actually, I suppose this is another good question. Why is um, Angela moving to the mail such a big talking point if the Express already had the story? Presumably she still worked for the Express and was interviewing Hugh. The Express would have asked us to talk about it or ask him some questions about it. I think it's it's literally just there so we can have the, the Malcolm scene. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. I think, yeah, this is the biggest problem with this series. Because, like, there's, they have funny scenes and they just come up with random bullshit to connect them. Yeah, you just gotta you gotta get from one to the other. Yeah. It 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 works just not when you've seen the other series, really, I feel like. Yeah. Hmm. But then that is an example, and I'm sure you'd like this. Uh Terry Coverley is the one who, who finds out what the Express is about to print, doesn't she? Oh uh, yes, of course she does. That's so what it, she does. Is that, is that yeah, exactly. Is that is that a case of Terry doing her job? It's a it's a case of Terry taking care of business. <laughs> like all day, every day. <laughs> So then we cut to Malcolm talking to Hugh in his office and bringing up the R word, which in this situation is resign. I'm sure many uh, listeners are relieved to hear that's what the R word is. Still acceptable for now. Yeah. Well, not really anymore, is it? They don't don't do it. (laughs) 
what I like about this is Hugh doesn't really understand that this is a big thing. He said, what, what do you want me to do, resign? As if that's <laughs> mental. And him just goes, gives him the stare. Yeah, his face just changes, yeah. doesn't it? Oh, yeah. and then he, that could work. <laughs> and then Hugh just starts panicking. Goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> I know you can't really take that back, can you? I do. I do like these things. Does this show that Hugh really doesn't understand what a big deal this is? I do think this kind of speaks to his character, just going, "Well, you know, I want an extra flat. Why can I have an extra flat?" It is a bit sort of entitled politician thing. They do try to humanise him a bit. But I do feel like he is a bit entitled politician. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's sort of that entitlement there. You know, look, I want a second flat, but they sort of acknowledge that it's, you know, everyone sort of has one. It's it's the dumb thing in Westminster. So you know, why should Hugh be any different? But yeah. I mean, the crucial thing here is the housing bill, right? I think because I think Angela Heaney points out there's like an empty home requisition order or something. Yeah, something like that. Something, something against empty homes. And obviously the minister most responsible for introducing this bill has an empty home in London. Yeah, it doesn't look good. So then we move to um, Hugh being left. This is a brilliant scene where he's left in the chair while uh, Malcolm goes <laughs> to talk to the PM. Because like, what would you do in that situation? He just, he just sinks into the chair. It just kind of fucks about for a bit. I know, but that's what's perfect, isn't it? Isn't this when Malcolm goes in to talk to the Prime Minister? Yeah. Yeah, you go, you go well, do you want me to just sit in? Or you go, no, because we're going to be talking about you. That would just be awkward, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's just like, oh, I just treat him like such a child. That must be one of the worst experiences, to be left there while people outside are deciding your fate. Yeah, well, yeah, while people are deciding what's going to be done with you and your career. But it's good news. There's an inquiry. Hooray. I mean, Hugh is, is very happy with that news. Yeah, I'm really confused about this because surely he has done something wrong and the inquiry is there to find out if he did anything wrong. I mean, this is in a different age, I, I guess, where things yeah. like this did get an inquiry. So in the only inquiry that I can think of that's been published recently was one about systemic racism. And I mean, nothing's come of that. Mm. And systemic racism is quite important. So... Uh, I guess inquiries don't really lead to much. I suppose we should take a moment to remember the days, or at least uh, fantasise about them, where flats were the biggest thing on the on the menu in the political world, not systemic racism. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So after this, we have Hugh going into the pantry, and there is a really weird extended scene of him eating biscuits. Yeah, in fact, these, these these biscuits sort of come up quite a bit. Yeah, I I watch. I could not remember how many times these biscuits are in this episode. <laughs> they do look nice, though. I mean, I give him that. I, I, I don't think they do. I, just like little chocolate shortbread things. Are they chocolate. I always I always imagine them. They look like gingerbreads. Oh, I mean, yeah. they could be. To be honest, should we just make this the podcast from now on? We'll just discuss this kind of biscuit. Oh, oh I don't know. Don't tempt me. <laughs> we'll take callers. What do you think the biscuits are? <laughs> Core on the line. <laughs> to me, it feels like padding. It feels like they need two extra minutes to so we'll have an extended scene where Hugh eats biscuits. I mean, yeah, but then I, I get I get the impression that it's just so like junior minister to to be on a chair away. in a kitchen yeah. eating biscuits. <laughs> yeah, you know the the assistant or the the you know the chief of staff at number ten or whatever offering you continually offering you biscuits, offering mm. to get you a chair so you don't have to stand. Yeah, who uh, the, is it? The chief of staff. Yes. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, she, we don't really find out who she is, do we? No. Well, I no, I don't think so. But she has the most patience out of anyone I've ever seen. I know she's so unflappable. Just. And we find out sort of later in the episode that she's got some kind of resentment towards him. The way she asks him for biscuits next time he's at number ten. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing on her face at the time. Just happy, smiley. Yeah. There's so much tension later yeah. on. But uh... shout shout out to her. She is a. We'll call her the biscuit queen for, for, for narrative purposes. Mm, the biscuit queen does yeah. does make those scenes in the pantry and outside mm. uh, the PM's office. And so then uh, we uh, talk. We get onto the topic of conversation of who's going to lead the inquiry. Yeah. So the, Hugh's rung the office, hasn't he? So yeah. He's got Glenn, Ollie, and Terry on the line. And uh, we later find out that it's going to be uh, the Right Honourable Lord Monkton. Ooh. I, I believe it's Cheshire. I can't remember. I think it's Cheshire. And this is, I think, one of my favourite parts about this episode is, um, well, in a little story, in 2019, I uh, went to see Wales versus England at the Principality Stadium in Cardiff uh, during the Six Nations. It was a match that uh, no one in Wales thought we were going to win. We, I thought we were going to get smashed. And then in the 77th minute, 
Josh Adams scored an amazing try in the corner to put Wales ahead and put the game out of England's grasp, effectively winning the game. The noise that I made at that point is exactly the same noise that Glenn makes when he hears that Lord Monkton's uh, presiding over the inquiry. <laughs> mm. He's going, yes! <laughs> yeah! Yeah, I, I imagine... I don't know. Is, is that because that's really all Glenn's got in his life? You know, what... what which member of the House of Lords Maybe. is heading up an inquiry? I don't know. Uh, this is another point, Matt. I think there might be a slight sexual tension between him and Hugh in this episode. There, there is a weird sort of scene, isn't there, where where Glenn does sort of touch Hugh? Yeah, the, I kind of follows his hand down his arm. Yeah, I don't know if that's why he's so happy, or if that's, or if it literally is like he is as invested in Hugh as I am invested in the Welsh rugby team. Yeah, Which, and if that is true, uh, Glenn needs to get some help. So life is good. Moncton's presiding over the, the inquiry. It's effective. Hugh's effectively out of the woods. It's all good. I know. Uh, that is definitely the impression that they're giving, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah, it's all good. Until, what's this? Out of nowhere. It's Hugh's driver with the chair. Oh, the driver. The driver's back. Your favourite character from the first episode is back <laughs> with a vengeance. And he's telling Lord Moncton that he heard Hugh and Glenn conspiring to sell the flat, but not actually sell it. Oh, see, now, Hugh tries to explain that away, doesn't he, by saying it was just in passing. I mean, can you really say something like that? I think, oh, well, we were just thinking about it. No, I don't think so. Like, if you're driving you to, like, talking about how you're going to kill your wife, and then your wife dies, say, well, yeah, but I was just, just chatting about it. I wasn't actually going to do it. I mean... Exactly. I only said it in passing. Okay. I didn't, I didn't, those knife wounds had nothing to do with me. Sorry, sorry. Is locker room talk now in court? What? <laughs> When's this started? <laughs> Well, yeah, exactly. You go into any locker room, you'll find boys talking about how they're going to sell their flats, how they're getting a mortgage. No one's actually doing it. Yeah, that's just how we do, you know. Just boys will be boys. boys yeah, exactly. Holding onto property and raising its value at the expense of the homeless. Yeah, that's hardcore. Lads, lads, fair. lads. So this raises the question: Why were they so happy with Moncton? It seems like he's led a very thorough investigation, and you know. Done like that, because that's what the evidence implied. I know he's actually pulled a blinder there by yeah. doing his job quite well and finding the damning evidence uh, that proves Hugh is lying. There you go. I don't know. I guess maybe it could have been worse. I think that's perhaps what they meant. Yeah. So in order to uh, offset the Moncton report, Malcolm gathers everyone except Hugh into his office. That's Terry, Glenn, and Ollie, and says, "One of you's got to go." Basically. I would like quickly like to shine a light on um, uh, the interaction between Malcolm and Ollie, where Malcolm says the wolves need a, a head sacrifice, and Ollie says we need to give them head. And Chris Allison gives the most please smoke a look I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I know you can almost yeah. you can almost tell that was improvised. He was yeah. ready with that. Yeah, fair play to Chris Allison, that was brilliant. Mm. And so we have this weird kind of who's going to go, who's not. I mean, it's a bit like the, the end of the series, The Walking Dead. You know, someone's going to die. You don't know who it's going to be. Obviously, with less stakes and less dramatic. <laughs> still. Yeah, not that you'd know it, though, by the way they talk about it. Yeah. I think Ollie and Glenn have already talked about who should resign over this if it came down to one or two of them. And uh, Ollie ends up calling Glenn Ronald fucking McDonald. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the sort of situation that we're at. This question, if you had to say you were Malcolm and you got to decide, who would you get rid of? Out of the three of them? Yeah. Ollie. Ollie? Yeah. Yeah. As much as I like Chris Allison, Ollie as a character isn't the nicest guy, or the second or third or fourth nicest. Yeah. Plus, you know, I mean, Glenn, Glenn is clearly invested in you. You know mm. that he'd do a good job staying there. He's got yeah. all the dudes behind him. And uh, Terry. I mean, she seems to know her job, even if the series keeps trying to tell me that she doesn't. Uh, well, this series is telling you that she doesn't know how to do a job, so... Hmm. <laughs> I see. We have we have opinions now as a podcast. Yeah, well, I'm taking the official podcast uh, stance on this, which is we like Terry. I see. What is the yeah. podcast stance on this? Yeah. Well, you can, yeah. go on it, but I have the deciding vote. So <laughs> I see that. that yeah. oh, that's okay. Mm. So then we have this frantic uh, scene of them back in Dosa deciding who will go, who won't go, and a little bit of an interesting scene, I think, where Glenn says, "I know things about you, Terry." And Terry becomes very concerned. 
yeah, this this interaction catches you a bit off guard. So I mm. thought it was such a weird like change in tone. You you expect it to be sarcasm, really, but mm. Glenn and Terry sort of treat it, treat it as if Glenn's opened Terry's closet and uh, actual skeletons have fallen yeah. out. Like, Which basic question: What's Terry done? Yeah, because <laughs> you've obviously done something. You don't get that nervous if you haven't done anything. If you're if your uh, closet is free of skeletons, she's obviously done something. Yeah, because they don't really paint Terry as someone who's sort of interested in what other people think about her. Yeah. You know, she's not desperate for approval. She just sort of begrudgingly does her job yeah. no matter what. She just wants a pay. Uh, she just wants a paycheck at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, even during this in, uh, this episode, she's sort of talking about, oh, we'll just get a new minister in. Mm. You know, it'll just be business as usual. I'll keep my job. Life will go on. She's not. In, uh, what could Glenn know? I don't know. I, I think she might have done some dirty deals for the opposition. Oh, oh. Yeah. I think it's uh, the, I think it was the thing she'd be most scared of. Especially if the with the uh, the opposite number, if that's still Peter Mannion at this point. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah it's I very possible. Do you think about it? What's the one the one thing that Terry would hate more than losing her job? Having to do her job whilst Malcolm hates her. Yeah. Because he could literally make her life a living hell, he found out. I bet not only could he make her life a living hell, but he could pull that, that same thing he threatened Angela Heaney with. You know, yeah. Terry never working comms again. Uh, but then to cap off this scene, we've got Hugh coming in and telling people he's decided to resign. He's like, I'm going to go. I've made a decision. And yeah, then so we- bas- basically flicking the visa at them and telling them to fuck off. Yeah, <laughs> I know. He really he he does sort of lay into the department a bit, doesn't he? You know, oh, sh- be shot off this fucking department. It takes four days to get a memo through. Mm. He, he's, 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 he's filled to the brim with tracks. He wouldn't get this lot working at the foreign office. It reminds me of um, an episode of The Simpsons where the family win the lottery and Homer quits his job at the uh, power plant. And Marge says to him, "Well, if things go wrong, you can always get your job back at the power plant." And he goes, "Whoa, not the way I quit." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, which, well, I mean, let's face it, I think a lot of people would think like that if they did something like win the lottery. Yeah. But, uh, or tendered their resignation. Yeah. But plot twist, Hugh's not going because Dan Miller has decided to step in and take and take the resignation for himself. Yeah. In fact, we're led on sort of a little, we're led up the garden path a little bit, aren't yeah. we? You see uh, Malcolm Tucker accept a resignation very pleasantly. Uh, but then we see Hugh Abbott still on his way to Den, to, to Den Downing Street. Who could this mystery resigner be? Of course it is none other than Dan Miller. So we think the reason that Dan Miller's done this is because it's opportunity, basically. He sees it as a way to get into higher office quicker than if he hadn't have done it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, all the characters see it as well. But rather than something to sort of be chastised or, oh, you know, what a what an asshole! This man's resigned off from his position solely for the chance for political advancement. And everyone's going, oh, what a move. Oh, he's He's beat you to it. What a what a twist. Yeah, it is, it is a good twist at the end of the episode. And then we just kind of have it petering out with Hugh deciding to sleep on Glenn's sofa and all that. It's just, yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, and, and what was that? A memo on urban renewal. And look, it only took us a day to get it. Yeah. Look, it does things kind of, already looking up. I like the way it ends because it does kind of peter out and it's almost like they've gone through the stages of grief. And they've got to acceptance where everything's a bit low. They, the anger's been, now they're just depressed. Ah, oh, yeah, because because we we missed out. To be fair, we missed out quite the plot point that uh, they do sell the flat. They do, yes, they do sell the flat. Yeah, I say they. Malcolm sort of does it yeah. without Hugh or Glenn's input. And uh, had to be done if you want, you know. Yeah, not that it really made much difference in the end. Yeah. So yeah, obviously Hugh's got to stay on Glenn's sofa if he wants to stay in London mm. for the night. In any episode of The Thick of It, there are the same aspects that make the show such a classic. In this section of the podcast, we will dissect them with their own segments and awards. The writer of The Thick of It, Armando E. Manucci, previously wrote one of the greatest British comedy characters of all time, Mr. Alan Partridge, and parts of his character have sifted through into The Thick of It. So in this segment, we will, we will be giving out the Alan Partridge Award for most Alan Partridge moment. Adam, what have you got? Well, I mean, any scene with Hugh Abbott and Dan Miller in the same room is yeah. eligible for this yeah. award, I thought. I mean, Hugh Abbott trying to interact with Dan Miller 
Um, but I have gone for Dan Miller's introduction scene when Hugh Abbott, that whole interaction, um, but specifically when Dan Miller finally turns to Hugh Abbott and, and acknowledges his existence in the room, I thought was just incredible. Like when yeah, you get uh, towards the end, when you get Dan Miller ready to leave, he says, oh, I've got a meeting. Well, I've got a, a game, a squash game, I think, with uh, someone from the Treasury. I think it's Pete Ooh. from the Treasury, I think. Pete from the Treasury, yeah. yeah. Oh, very fancy, very fancy. Mm. And then Hugh just sort of throws in, well, you know, I've, I've also got a meeting with the Prime Minister. And then Dan's like, oh, that's that's impressive. And you have it just, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. Nope. Nope. Yeah. But I think that's, that would be my Alan Partridge moment. That is a very good just, one. I, I had that written down as well. <laughs> that is, yeah. yeah. Specifically that. No, it isn't. It's not that impressive. Yeah. You know? I got a couple of uh, little ones for this. Um, Ollie saying, I'm going to take you down, motherfucker. In his <laughs> sort of like gangster accent or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, what, the main one I've gone for is, and uh, this is a gem of a scene in itself, which is... Angela Heaney in the fishbowl while Hugh uh, gets yelled at by Malcolm just outside. The, <laughs> the way they muffle the shouting <laughs> and you can just hear certain words come through is brilliant. I know. It's the way that the volume sort of ramps up. Like, as he starts, he's clearly aggressive, but he's not shouting. And then you hear that muffled yeah. shouting. And then the door opens as Terry comes in. The door is the pinnacle of this bit where you just say, <laughs> you fucking prick! You get in there! You want to just bullshit up! And he, like, catches himself. <laughs> he like realizes. <sighs> okay, meltdown over. This is one of the scenes that every time I watch it, even though I've watched it like ten times, I can't stop laughing out loud. It's so funny. I know, it really is. Peter yeah. Capaldi and uh, I can't remember the guy's name who plays the other. Uh, Chris Chris Langham. Chris Langham. Mm. The yeah, the way they do that is is mm. incredible. Even when they're in the background, whilst Terry is like asking Angela if she wants any tea or biscuits, like he's, Peter Capaldi is still going for it. Yeah. I mean, that, that is partridge beyond belief, that is. <laughs> In any episode of The Thick of It, there are always lines that can only come out the mouth of Mr. Malcolm F. Tucker. So in this segment of the podcast, we will be going over the many Tuckerisms of the episode. Adam, what, what sort of Tuckerisms you got for this one? Okay, so for Tuckerisms, I thought the, the one that got me, which is just full of like pure venom mm. and vile, is um, when he's talking about I think he's talking to, um, about to call him Chris Addison, Ollie, uh, about about trying to get Angela Heaney to drop the story. Yeah. Uh, and he just starts talking about, oh, well, fuck it, fine, I'll have to kill you both then. And then Ollie goes, oh yeah, well, wouldn't that make you? Wouldn't wouldn't that be all right or something? And then Malcolm Tucker turns turns around. He goes, oh no, that was a joke, by the way, and not a nice one. It's a pretty nasty one that hides a lot of feelings about this fucking department. Yeah. I mean, I thought, that, yeah, yeah, that's pretty. That's the sort of thing I expect Malcolm's therapist to write in their book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like a, a rare glimpse into the hatred of Malcolm Tucker. Obviously, how and how he he can't just straight out say I hate you. He has to sort of mm -hmm. like dress it up in just a, a nasty, vile joke. I feel like at that point, if someone went, "Are you okay, Malcolm?" He just go. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or cave their head in with a brick. Yes, that is also a very good possibility. <laughs> yeah, one of the two. Hmm. And it makes them do something. It's just a classic, nice little Tuckerism. We love to see it. Hmm. But my favourite Tuckerism in the episode is... Not a Tuckerism in terms of its content, but in terms of its delivery, which is when he's running through Dosa and you say, get out of the way! <laughs> so I don't think we talked about the tone of a Tuckerism yet, but that is a Tuckerism in of itself. I know, yeah. The desperation, that... the anger, you can feel the venom off it. It's, it's brilliant. I know. It's, it's, it's the misplaced anger. Well, I said the misplaced anger. It's, this, is, this is just someone in his way. <laughs> and yet, yeah, fucking get out of the way. Get out of the way! Yeah, yeah, you, you can you can see the anger sort of flowing through him. Uh, just these these feelings that you, you need some kind of release for. You feel you can feel the panic in the voice, but it's overrided by his innate anger at just people in general. I know, yeah, just at, at the fact that he seems to be in this situation. One of the biggest parts of the thick of it is the bullying. So in this segment, we will be giving out the Pretty Patel Award for biggest <laughs> bullying moment. <laughs> does that get you every time? Does it? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Well, let, let's let's have yours then. Let's be you and you. Okay. That award name gets me every time. Um, so for the bullying moment, my bullying moment, I actually went for an implied sort of off-screen bullying. No. Oh. Um, yeah, that uh, we get in the first scene with Dan Miller, where we find out that he's done a lot of work to get this bill past its, um, I don't know, reading committee stage, I think they say. Um, I go, oh, yeah, really good job with the, with the backbench MPs. I don't know how you did it. And then he just turns around and goes, look, all, I, all I'm saying is, if you want to make an omelette, you're just going to have to have a frank and honest discussion with the eggs. And that makes me think he could have said anything to those yeah. backbench MPs to get it through. It is very sort of patronising or he has some kind of self-justification for it. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. I, I just think it leaves a lot of scope for him to either have gone full Tucker on them or sort of on the other end of the spectrum to have just sort of subtly threatened, I don't know, leaking yeah. something or their family. I don't know. I don't know how much he'd like do bullying. So you assume if you need someone to be bullied, he'd get Malcolm in on it. Yeah, and in fact, he does sort of do that, doesn't he? I think, I think Malcolm calls it weighing his balls with a yeah, with with a sort of situation for Malcolm to solve. I suppose but Malcolm also. I do have another. Uh, there is a bit where Malcolm says that um, I wouldn't pull your pisser. I know where it's fucking been. <laughs> that might that might have something to do with what he's had to do to get this bill passed. Yeah, well, yeah, you never know. Exactly. That's that's, that's why the that's been the scope's been. Yeah kept so broad it really has like a yeah. sort of sinister aspect to dan miller's character exactly not necessarily the shouty bully mm-hmm. but you know very much someone who you do not want to work with yeah it's a bit sort of ted bundy-esque yeah <laughs> yeah obviously the hallmark of any good bully yeah <laughs> so yeah that was my top bullying moment but i mean q is the butt of so many yeah moments in this episode yeah. that you could really pick any any scene within it my pretty tell was going to go to um Malcolm bringing in Glenn and Terry to shout at. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I in think... the very much in the spirit of the award, I think. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's fairly ordinary in Route One as a moment, but I do imagine it's the sort of thing that Pretty Patel would do, allegedly. <laughs> Alleg- ex- exactly. Mm. Uh, an inquiry was found. What well, was found? Mm. No, no evidence. Another big part of the thick of it is the meltdown. So in this segment of the podcast, we will be giving out the Chernobyl Award for the best meltdown of the episode. Adam, what, what are you giving your Chernobyl to? Well, obviously there are, well, like every episode of the thick of it, there are a couple of meltdowns that, that, yeah. that could go up for this award. That, that's why it's a segment. Exactly. Uh, it was a good segment. Whoever came up with it deserves a bit of credit. And uh... Yeah, he sounds like a proper genius. <laughs> the... The scene after Hugh goes into that interview and he just has no idea what's happening. Mm-hmm. And he's just standing there. And he, he's going, you know, I denied being a racist, I hope. And then I think Ollie says, you know, you didn't go down the route of saying, oh, you've got loads of black friends. He's no, well, no, I, I, well, I don't have any. <laughs> um, that, that, no. That's a very partridge thing in of itself, isn't it? <laughs> that, you no, know, yeah. to be fair, there is some crossover yeah. there. And then, and then what does he say? I think for the, the peak meltdown, he's, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he says, this is madness. I just own a flat. I haven't raped somebody. Yeah. And knowing what we now know about Chris Lyon, that hasn't aged well. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, <laughs> but, 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 we'll try not well. to dwell on it because this tries to be a nice little light-hearted podcast. Yeah. So just appreciating the thick of it in its, in its humour. Yeah. But yeah, that would, that, my Chernobyl is for yeah. Hugh Abbott just sort of falling apart in that scene. I have a, uh, I want to quickly mention my runner-up which is Hugh Abbott's uh, rant uh, with, in Malcolm's office. Is, is that what you're talking about? His rant? Oh, I don't think so. What, what one is this? Well, I've, I've, uh, the word I've used to describe this rant is uh, Dan Miller cyber prick. <laughs> ah, yes. Yes. Which what is a we, nice, yeah. nice little one-liner as it goes. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, to be fair, that is a brilliant meltdown. He's talking about how they should just clone ministers. Hmm. It's a very good meltdown. But I've decided to give it to Ollie after Glenn tells him he should resign or agrees with him that he should resign because it's such a primary school argument. It really... saying, yeah, yeah, I agree, yeah. No, no I, didn't, I wasn't actually talking about it. No, yeah, it was just, a, just an academic discussion. Yeah. I didn't actually mean it. There's so much panic and fear in his voice when he talks about it. But also, I want to point out this has been won for me by the fact that Glenn is drinking a can of Tango. <laughs> <laughs> I know, well... I... Do you ever see them drink a drink like that again with the logo so clearly displayed yeah. in front of the in front of the camera? And also, we should address this now. What kind of monster drinks Tango of a Fanta? <laughs> oh, I don't remember the last time I've had Tango. No one does. 
Only, <laughs> only wrong uns drink tango. It's not. It's not on. Then to be fair, the first time I was sick from alcohol was because I was drinking vodka and Fanta. So I haven't really been a fan of that since. Vodka and Fanta. Yeah. Is that thing. Not to me anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if people do that at all. No, oh, apparently that's a thing. I'll, I'll try it on June twenty first. Uh, oh, filmed just after the roadmap. Yeah. Lad, lad, lad. Um, but yeah, do you know what gets me about that scene is they've tried so hard to make it look casual, mm. just like two workmates out for a smoke and a drink, and yet somehow it still just feels so off to me. Yeah, it does feel a bit off. I don't know if it's just that like the chemistry is not quite there between um, James Smith, who plays Glenn, and uh, Chris Allison. Possibly. Mm. Yeah, maybe it's just because you don't you don't see them like that again. Yeah. As you're all currently missing our nights out, we are now going to look at your night out as told by the thick of it quotes. Adam, what have you got? So I've only got a couple lines uh, mm. for this section. I didn't really see them much in the episode. A couple right at the end when Glenn, well, one is when Glenn is talking to Hugh. Hugh sort of left, been left disgraced by uh, the fact that Dan Miller resigned before him and he's got to come back into the department. And he's, he's a bit low. And then Glenn just sort of touches him, which I'm not including in the night out bit. Um, <laughs> but he just sort of whispers into his ear, we'll ride again. <laughs> I thought that held particular salience for a night out, yeah. uh, especially in these circumstances. And then the other one was uh, when Glenn is talking about how Hugh just sort of dropped him in it. I guess 37 years and just like that, he's willing to just drop me in it. But when your mate leaves you in the, in the club, what, why would your mate leave you? Either for the toilet or because he's, he's speaking to the girl. Either way. Right. I can understand speaking to a girl, but you can't have a go in for going to the toilet. You can if he's been away for sort of 30 minutes, 40 minutes. You can't have like top 10 anime shows of all time. My mate's left me in the club to go have a piss. No, that, uh, no, that is true. That's a bit harsh and a bit needy. O- only if he's gone to the toilet and then come back. I mean, what if he's yeah. gone off on an, on an adventure? Though? All right, fair enough. Then, the then you can have a go. But if he's got for a piss and come straight back, that seems a bit harsh to say, you left me. <laughs> Where'd you go? Yeah. I've been stuck here on my own. But yeah, th- those are the two that I had. Mm. I've gone for one that I don't think necessarily represents us, but I feel like it would represent some people. Yeah. Which is, uh, you're out on a night out, you, f- you feel at the end of your work, you're getting tired. You, got, you turn to your mate, who's an all-nighter, who enjoys going out all night, which is probably us. Y- yeah. Absolute legends. Yeah. And you say, I want to go home. He said, No, no, you can't go home. You got to stay out. It's like, I'm just tired. Is that a crime now being shattered? <laughs> just sad. I just want to go home. <laughs> I want to get Mackies. Oh, uh, yeah. We, we, oh. I bet you have that kind of guy. McDonald's yeah. in the morning on his way back from the office. No, nah, no. Nah. I, I bet he leaves at 11 so we get the last train back. <laughs> Boo. He's that kind of guy. <laughs> Drunk on the train, yeah. Hmm. Bloody hell. But uh, yeah, I can see that as a, as a night out moment. Yeah. In any episode of The Thick of It, a single mistake always leads to a complete fuck up, which is why in this segment we will be giving out the OJ Simpson Award for Who's to Blame. So, Adam, who's to blame? Who is to blame? Well, I mean, I feel like this is almost a shared award this year. Yeah. I think that we can give it to a couple of people. Yeah. Uh, for the same fuck up, to be fair. Um, it's got to be Hugh and Glenn. Not selling that flat. Yeah, I, I, I've given it only to Glenn though because Hugh claims that he didn't know Glenn was actually doing it. Oh yeah, he claims that Glenn, mm. but then you get the driver come in. He's like, yeah, I heard them, I heard them talking about it. Moncton yeah, but, foils him. Yeah, but he didn't know he was actually being serious about it. Uh, so, I, yeah. yeah, but I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I can stretch to it being shared between Glenn and Hugh for this. Then yeah. Well, yeah, especially since it's Hugh's flat, he knows he's yeah. got to get rid of it. But, uh, yeah, because the plan is shite. Just like sell, either sell the flat or tell the journalists to fuck off. Basically, exactly. you, you're not going to have a, a foot mm. in both worlds here, are you? Yeah. Um, I did put uh, Hugh's daughter Alicia just for a for a joke. It's, <laughs> it's her ear infection that keeps him out of the house, isn't it? And it's not even an ear infection. So you're you're blaming the ki- you're blaming the kids for this, are you? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think Hugh yeah. and Glenn take it. Yeah. Because the, the flat shouldn't be around for Alicia to take him away yeah. from. Well, luckily, I now know what the title of this episode is going to be, which is Adam Taylor Hates Kids. <laughs> that was going for Twix. Join us next time when we clean up our mother's piss. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to share it with friends, loved ones, fellow swearing enthusiasts and strangers. And until next time, fuckity bye. <laughs> <laughs>